Uh, I'd like to start with an apology uh, to my fellow cat lovers that they need to choose between two talks whose both speakers have pictures with cats on their backs, so sorry for that. Uh, yeah, that's me, my name is Arkadiusz. Uh, I'm from, I'm, from, I'm from Krakow, I'm a computer science student, and I've been working uh, in Erlang Solutions for two years now with Erlang and Elixir. We are write, all of us are writing stateful applications in Elixir in whatever other language. Even if, you're, if we're using a database, I think that still counts as our application being stateful. So, in Erlang and Elixir, we have other choices. If, if we need to keep some data uh, to serve our, u our, our users, we could use ETS, for example, or a simple state of a gen server instead of a database. Uh, so when more and more users are coming to use our application, we usually add more and more nodes to handle that traffic. So in this case, our stat stateful application becomes a distributed stateful application. So if you are using a database before that, then you're probably going to use the database now because well, it, it helps you even more if many nodes are accessing data layer. Um, but if you were using some BIM tools, then you're pretty much left with the only choice, uh, which is Mnesia. Uh, by the way, how many of you have used Mnesia at all? And how many of you have used Erlang? I see a correlation here. Uh, yeah, so Mnesia is a database bundled with the Erlang standard library. Uh, it's built on top of Erlang distribution protocol and ETS, so basically you don't need any third party uh, dependencies to use Mnesia. You just start Mnesia application and you can use that. And it was built with replication in mind, so it was built exactly for distributed stateful applications. To ensure data consistency between the Mnesia clusters, uh, it provides us with transactions for, um, for submitting operations to our data store. But the term transaction might mean different things when it comes to different databases, so I'd, li I'd like to go through what guarantees uh, do Mnesia transactions give us when it comes to data consistency. So in a healthy cluster like that, where we have three nodes all up and running and connections between our, them are healthy, then if we write something under, some value under the key on a single node using Nisia, that node will coordinate the transaction between other nodes and if, and if everything still is up and running, then that transaction will complete successfully and we will have the same data on every node in the cluster, which is what we want probably. If one of our nodes suddenly goes down, the well, lightning strikes one of our servers, and that server is totally unusable, we still can start a transaction from any of the remaining nodes, and Nuja will still allow us to coordinate that transaction, and we'll write that data on both of the remaining nodes. But what is even better is that when the, then the failing node goes up again, it will catch up with its missing data and the state of the whole cluster will be consistent once again, even though we have experienced a failure. But one of the most difficult situations which can happen in a distributed system is probably a net split or a network partition where suddenly our single cluster becomes two clusters. So we have one two node cluster with A and C and a single node cluster with uh, B only. So by default with Mnesia, we are still able to initiate transaction from any of the nodes in both of, the, of those partitions. If we write the data under the same data under the same key, uh, obviously the transaction on the B node will complete immediately because there is no other node to coordinate that transaction with. ANC will still need to run a coordination protocol to ensure that data on both of, the, of these nodes is consistent but it will complete successfully even though they cannot communicate with B. And when the net split is healed later, uh, well, the state of the cluster is consistent once again, even though we have experienced a network partition. But if, you, if we write some, some, value, some different values under the same key in those distinct partitions, then 
obviously those transactions as previously will complete successfully, but when the net split is healed, Nija will tell us that it's running an inconsistent network of nodes, that it has detected a data conflict and it will require you to fix that data. Nija basically doesn't mind that it's running inconsistent uh, copies of, the, of your table, but well, if you care about consistency of the data, you probably uh, don't want uh, that behavior in your, si in your system. So you need to fix that. To circumvent those cases, you could use the majority option. Basically, you, when you create a Nija table, you tell it to, hey, allow us to start a transaction only if the node where I, where I initiate a, trans a transaction can see at least half of the nodes uh, which hold the copies of our table. So in the case uh, like here, only A and C would be able to initiate a transaction at, at all and B will be completely unusable. So here we are trading consistency of our data for availability of the, of the whole system. So looking at that, Nisha looks as a pretty nice system given that it's a build in the Erlang VM basically because it's built on those tools we all of us can use uh, when using the Erlang VM. In addition, it allows us to pick between availability and consistency because, well, by default we have available transactions so we can write everywhere. We have majority option, we have consistency, but some of our nodes will not be available. But unfortunately, it, has, it still has some flaws. Uh, for example, an ETS table for each transaction initiated in the system. So if you run many, many small transactions and you have burst of those, then probably Erlang VM will run out of ETS table. Probably not something you want to have. And basically, if you want a presentation from the company who has used extensively, that's not working, right? It's cut now. Yeah. I'll take that. Hold it close. Check, check. That's better. So every company who has used Mnija extensively, when they, when they present something at conferences like that, they will tell you that Mnija is quite good piece of software. It allowed them to solve their problems, but you need to handle it with care. It's a bit unpredictable, especially during network partitions or after network partitions. So I have been asking myself, can we do better than that? Or rather, can we do something different than that? I wanted to find a storage system which could allow us to build, uh, which could be working natively on the beam like Mija is. So just start some application on the Erlang VM, connect my nodes, and that's it. That should be working. But at the same time, I'd like that storage system to be predictable so that after a network partition or during a network partition, I will know what exactly what will happen. And I didn't have to look far, and I have found CRDTs, which obviously are central regional dental testing services, or at least that's what will show up as the first result, but on Bing.com, not Google. Don't use Bing. But Google knows what CRTT stands for really, and of course these are conflict-free replica replicated data types. So CRTT is basically a data type, a data structure, and a set of functions to modify the values of that data type. So this is what we're doing in Elixir every day. We, we take values, we maybe pipe those to some functions, and we get new values out of that. For example, we could have an integer data type and increment and decrement operations or a set data type when we can add elements to a set or remove elements from the set. And with CRDTs, if we can take this data type and those functions and shape them in such a way that they fit into specific rules imposed by CRDTs, then what we will get in return is eventual consistency of copies of these values in our system by using optimistic replication. So not only we are sure that no matter what happens in the system, all the values will be the same, but we can achieve that without any synchronization between the nodes. We just need to broadcast some messages to, to our peers in the cluster, and we are sure that everything will work correctly. And today I'd like to introduce you to one uh, specific flavor of CRDTs, which are state-based CRDTs. There is also another type of them called operation-based, but it makes some assumptions on reliability of communication channel between the nodes. 
So I guess it couldn't be used that easily with Erlang distribution protocol as state-based could. So when it comes to a data type, what are the requirements for our data structure? The first requirement is that we need to define a comparator, a compare function. That comparator takes two values of our data type and returns a Boolean. It returns true if its first argument is greater than or equal to the other one. It returns false if the first one is smaller than, than the other one. What is important is that the comparator defines a partial order among the values of our data type, meaning that some of the terms, some of the values, might be completely uncomparable. So no matter how we order them, uh, how, how we apply the comparator to them, we will always get false. The other thing we need to define for, for our data type is a merge operation. So as, as the name suggests, it merges things. It takes two values of our data type and returns a new value, which should be greater than or equal to both of them. But on, not any value which is greater than both of them, but at least upper bound. So the smallest value which is greater than both operands of merge. And based on that, we can make two observations. The first one is that if some value is greater than the other one, then merging both of them will give us that greater value in return because that value is equal to itself. It's greater than, it's greater than, greater than the other one, so it's at least upper bound of them both. Uh, and also merge is idempotent operation, so if we apply it to two copies of the same value, we will get that value in return because, it, well, basically each data structure, each value possible is equal to itself, so it is its own least upper bound. And if your data type has those properties, you can call it a join semi-lattice and you can use that term to look smart at conferences, so don't use that. But let's do an example. Let's do a set. Uh, CRTTs are often explained on sets because I guess they're just simple to, to explain. So our comparator could check if the first set uh, in a pair is a superset of the second one or, is it, or if it's equal to the second one. Our merge could just compute a union of those two sets. And we can see that this merge is in fact correct one, that in fact it returns a least upper bound of, of its arguments because a result of a union of two sets contains elements from both of these sets. So it is at least equal to both of them, but most likely it is a superset of those. So it is greater than or equal to its operands uh, in terms of the comparator we have defined before. So given those operations, uh, we don't need to get into functions yet which modify the values. So given those operations, those properties of our data structure, we can talk about the protocol which CRDTs use to ensure consistency of the data in our cluster. So basically merge is what is driving the protocol of CRDTs. Compare is just used to ensure that merge is indeed correct and that in, in fact it returns the least upper bound of its operands. Well, let's get to the point. Uh, let's imagine a free node cluster where each node in the cluster has some initial value of our CRDT and each value is different. With state-based CRDTs, each replica periodically broadcasts its state to other nodes in the cluster. You could broadcast to, to every node in the cluster, you could use some kind of gossip protocol, but basically you need to ensure that at some point, each replica receives all the distinct values which are there in the cluster. So let's just do a simple broadcast. Let's imagine that, oh, I've, oh, come on. Oh, magic button. Yeah. Uh, other replicas in the cluster, when they receive some values uh, from their neighbors, they take their current state they merge, they merge it with the incoming value and that the result of that merge becomes their new state. So let's run a series of, let's run a protocol of state-based CRDTs in this case. Let's imagine that A broadcasts its state first, so B and C has, have both received that, then B does the same and B broadcasts uh, both two values which it, which it holds holds and we can see that A and C received those two values and they already have some duplicate entries. And then C does the same and it sends all the four values it had. And with state-based CRDTs, if you want to ensure that 
eventually all those values, all those replicas hold the same data structure, we need to prove that merging those sequences of values, one after another, leads to the same value uh, at each replica. And in fact, that's really simple. It's really simple to show that because the least upper bound in algebra in order theory is not computed. It's not computed on two values like merge does. So merge is a binary operation. But in general, least upper bound is computed on sets of values. So we could just compact those sequences to sets of three values. And, sin and since those are the same at each replica, then the result of then the least upper bound of those is also the same. So we have the eventually consistent replicas in our cluster. Uh, I hope that you, be you believe me that no matter what happens and no matter if we had a network partition, as long as th those distinct values uh, reach all the replicas in the cluster, then the state of, of our system will converge to that single value. Oh, and by the way, replicas still broadcast uh, their state, even if they reach the consensus, uh, after all. But uh, it doesn't matter because merge is idempotent operation. And, it, well, they have the same value as they receive, so the result of that is, is that value, so it doesn't matter. Well, let's talk about functions. Functions in state-based CRDTs, there are really no requir requirements for them, unlike the data structure. But we need functions to modify the values uh, of CRDTs in our system, because if we wouldn't modify them, then we could, we could have just used constants, and that's it. So functions, in case of state-based CRDTs, are sometimes referred to as mutators, because they mutate the current state of the replicas. So mutators look like that. They take the current state of the replica and some optional arguments and return the new state of that replica. And we apply it only uh, to one node in the whole cluster, the so-called source replica. And that replica, obviously, later, after the after application of that mutator, it broadcasts its new state to other nodes in the cluster. And, well, we hope that that new state will propagate to other nodes as well, and that this will be our new uh, final value. Oh, and just to clear one thing up, merge and compare are not mutators because you will never use them directly to modify anything. They are operations and properties of our data structure which drive the protocol of CRDTs, and mutators are used to modify the values of our data type, and you'll use that to, to change anything in your system. Example time, again. Uh, in case of sets, add, add and remove mutators are really obvious. They just add element to a set and remove elements and, from a set, and that's it. So there's nothing special about them. That's how you would write a, a set data structure. You just add elements to a set and remove elements from a set. Yeah, but, sorry, uh, fun I have told you that functions in state-based CRDTs bring a couple of problems, and let's see the first one. If we have a cluster like that, with two nodes, uh, and both replicas have the same copy of our value, and we, want, and we decide that we want to remove uh, the two from the set in the first replica. So, of course, finally we want that two to be removed at every replica in the cluster. So we end up, at first, we end up with something like that. So we have only one in the first replica, one and two in the second replica, but the CRDT's protocol is still running, so replicas exchange their state with each other, and they merge the incoming state, and the result of that merge is the same value we had before. So there's the removal of, of that element of the set didn't have any effect on the overall state of the system because it got dominated but by the value we had already before. So this kind of set is called a G-set or grow-only set because it can only grow in time. If remove doesn't have effect on the state of our system, then we can just not use remove at all or not, or not define it at all. So we can only add elements to that set. And by the way, this is the perfect set for business people because your number of active users can only grow in time. <laughs> but yeah, the point is that grow only set highlights, I guess, the most important pro or the most nasty problem of state-based CRDTs. 
And yeah, in state-based CRDTs, bigger values dominate the smaller ones. Uh, we have seen that on with the observation we have made before, that if we compare two values and the one is greater or equal than the other, and then when merging them, we will get that greater value as the result. So bigger values dominate. But removing things in general, as we tend to think about it, even in terms of, of simple, pure data structures, shrinks values of our data types. In the case of sets, removing elements from a set makes that new set a subset of what we, ha of what we had before. The same is, for example, for integer. If we decrement an integer, it becomes smaller than the number we had previously. So the solution to that is so, well, yeah, so by the way, this is what happened at our source replica. So we applied a mutator. Uh, we have compared that and it turned out that the resulting value was smaller than the one we had before. And when we merged those, uh, the bigger value we had previously dominated uh, the new one. Yeah, so the solution to that is to design removing functions in such a way that they inflate the values of our data type. So removing things in a logical sense must inflate our state, so make it bigger in terms of our compare function. So in case of sets, the simplest solution to achieve that is to use the so-called tombstone set or just tombstones. So now our data structure is no longer a simple set but two sets, a pair of sets. So if we add an element to a set, we add it only to the first uh, set in the pair. If we remove something from a set from our logical CRDT, we don't remove anything from those two sets, but we add an element to the second set in a pair. Yeah, and this is how it looks like. So let's imagine that we start with an empty set. We add one to that set. So we have one in the first pair in the set. Then we add two. So two ends up we, in the first set as well. And then we remove one. So one is in the second set because we added one's tombstone to, to, the, to the set CRDT. So this data structure, what it, what it describes is that uh, the first set in the pair is it shows us what elements has this copy of certainty has observed being removed from being added to that set. So in this case, A has, on, has seen one being added to the set, B has seen one and two being added to the set, and C has seen one and two added to the set as well. And in addition, C has also seen one being removed from the set. So we kind of now observe the events which shaped uh, the which shaped the value of our data type and what we want in uh, in the end is to our c data structure with, which has observed the one being removed to be greater than than the b so the one which has also which also had one and two but it hasn't removed uh, one yet and obviously, we, we, we also want B to be greater than A, but we already had that previously with the grow only set. So our comparator in this case should look like that. We check if the first, if the first argument of comparator has seen at least the same number of elements or at least the same elements being added to the set as the second one, and also if it has seen at least the, the same elements being removed from the set. So in this case, C has seen the same elements being added, but it has also seen uh, one being removed. So it's greater than B in terms of our comparator function. And merge just computes a pairwise union of both, but I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Oh, and with this kind of uh, data structures, which with this kind of CRDTs, which no longer have a shape of a logical data structure we want to maintain, we need to define query functions which read values from our data type. So in case of sets, we'd maybe like to, to check if element is inside the set. So in case of this one we, ha we have right now, we check if something has been added to a set. So if it is in the first set, but not removed yet. So if it is not in the, in the second set, and we just check if element uh, is there. But this kind of set highlights another problem of state-based CRDTs, or it's just not 
solution which is good enough to, to use that in a real world. Let's start with an empty set and run a couple of transformations on that. So let's add one first, uh, add two, remove one and add one again. And even though we have first removed one from the set and added it later, so at the logical level, that one st should still be there. Right, in a regular set, one should be in a set, but our query function shows us that one is not in the set. And the reason for that is that, well, we can see it from the, from the shape of our data structure, that, that the shape of it hasn't changed between the remove one step and add one step. It is the same, which means that elements can be added to this kind of set, then can be, they can be removed later, but they can never be added again. So yeah, this, this isn't the set we were looking for. This kind of set is called a two-piece set or two-phase set. And there are solutions to that, but they're not uh, as simple as tombstones are. But Academia got our back in this, in this case, and we could, we could use the so-called causal contexts. Uh, they're also referred to as version, version vectors or vector clocks. There are multiple names for that, but it, all of them boil down to the same idea, that our data structure should also con contain some value which represents the version of, of that particular copy of that value. And that version is later used to merge different values over CRDT uh, in, a in, a in a semantically correct way and to resolve conflicts between those values. So we won't get into detail now, but I really recommend reading the paper I have linked here. It explains one of the possible implementations of that uh, really well. But there is another problem with state-based CRDTs in general, not related to functions particularly, but, but generally in how they work, how the protocol of state-based CRDTs work. And the problem is that the whole state of each replica is periodically sent to all other replicas in the cluster. So if you were running a presence protocol, if you were tracking presence of users in your system, so for each user, you have an entry in a set and your system is really, really popular, so you have one million active users, then you would send one million element set every time to all other nodes in the cluster. Now you could imagine that this might become quite inefficient, so we need to circumvent that. And the solution to that is to use uh, deltas, which are, again, really well disclaimed, descri described in this paper, which is actually the same paper I have, I have linked before. And the, the idea is that with regular function, functions, which regular mutators, uh, the mutator have returned the new state of our replica. Delta mutator, as you can see, also returns the value of our data type, but it should return the smallest value of that data type, which describes the change which occurred by application of that delta mutator. And the rule is that merging the previous state of our uh, CRDT with application of delta mutator should return the same value as application of regular mutator. So in case of uh, sets and of, in case of grow only sets where add mutator added element to a set, delta mutator add could just return a one element set with the new element to be added. So merging that new set, that small set, with the old one would result in computing a union of those two sets, and this is exactly what regular add mutator does, so the rule holds uh, true in this case. But it's not that easy to use deltas uh, as in this example, because that's grow only set which we could uh, use without deltas at all and without causal context, but in reality, when dealing with deltas, we also need to consider order of events in our system. So we can no longer send our state as we want, or no longer set, send the deltas as we want, but we need to consider the order in which modifications or events happened in our system. So it's a little bit harder, but of course there are, there are papers which describe how to, how to do that, and there are, there are real world implementations uh, which, which use exactly that, because without using deltas, I guess that, that using CRDTs at all would be really unfeasible. 
But why bother at all about CRDTs? I've been talking about them for a while now, uh, and if you're not convinced yet, uh, I try to convince you even more. So first of all, the confidence, the thing I have mentioned at the beginning, that working with our data, that we are confident when working with our data, we are sure that no matter what happens in our system, in our cluster of nodes, so if there is, if there is some node failing, if there is a network partition, we are sure that all the replicas will reach the same value. In addition, CRDTs allow us to achieve that by requiring from us only to define pure functions and data structures. So we don't need to worry about distributed transactions. Well, we need to consider ordering of events if we use deltas, but in general case we don't. Uh, we don't need to care about consensus at all. We just need to define pure functions, pure data structures, of course correctly, but I guess it's still easier than, than dealing with all the problems which distributed systems impose on us in a general case. And additionally, they increase our understanding of distributed systems in general. When I was re learning about CRDTs, I guess I have learned a lot a lot more about distributed systems than about CRDTs partic in particular. But what is even better is that CRDTs are in fact used by many popular databases, so you're at the same time learning how these databases work under the hood. So most notably React, uh, which is an Erlang database, from version 1.4, React uh, exposes a direct CRDT interface, so you can create CRDT values, you can modify them with mutators, and later you can query them to, to retrieve those values. But actually React, from the very beginning, used some ideas which are also used in CRDTs to ensure uh, conflict-free replication between React nodes. So it's not only from version 1.4, but from this particular version, you can use them directly. Uh, the other one is Cassandra. Cassandra's counter data type uses CRDT implementation to ensure that after network partitions, uh, counters in, in clusters which were disconnected are still, uh, well, will converge to the same value after the net split is healed. So before that, they had problems with too many increments being count counted or too many decrements. So basically, after network partition, counter has shown uh, invalid value. Uh, the other one is Dynamo, which isn't exactly the uh, database, but rather a description of database architecture, which, by the way, I think React is based on. Uh, but they also use some ideas related to CRDTs. Uh, but in Dynamo, it's the client of the database who needs to resolve conflicts uh, in, in CRDT values. So Dynamo uses vector clocks, from what I remember, and it's the client who needs to decide what value sh is the correct one uh, when, the, when the conflict happens. Because in, in case of state-based CRDTs, as we have seen, it's the storage nodes who resolve the conflicts unambiguously. And the last one is Antidote. So this isn't particularly a popular database. It's, I think it started as a research project. And it's very similar to React in that it provides a CRDT interface, but it allows you to run transactions on top of that. So if you need more strict uh, forms of, of consistency, you can use transactions uh, besides CRDTs with Antidote. So I think th that's pretty amazing. And you can use them too without using any database. Uh, I have told you at the beginning that one of my goals was to find something which could be used uh, on top of the tools existing on the beam, and CRDTs can be used like that. So right now, probably the easiest and most yeah, probably the easiest way to do that is via LASP. So LASP is a set of libraries uh, for writing highly available uh, distributed systems in Erlang or Elixir, basically every language which runs on the beam. And one of the main LASP's features is that it allows you to define the state of your system in terms of CRDTs. 
So we can declare CRDT variables. In this case, we create a grow-only state-based set, so the one we've seen at the very beginning uh, with set identifier. Later, we can update that set uh, with uh, our mutator, so we add one to that set. And later we can query that, that variable, so we will, we will get the, our logical set representation uh, with that query function. Uh, these are a couple of references for you to, to dig further into CRDTs. Uh, the first two are papers, kind of classics when it comes to CRDTs, but you probably need to read only one of them because they are very similar. Uh, the third one is the one with causal contexts and the deltas. I think that's a must read because it explains those concepts really, really well. And it talks about real world application uh, of CRDTs, so it's not that theoretical. Uh, the fourth link is the link to Chris McCord's uh, talk where he was introducing Phoenix Presence for the first time, because in fact Phoenix Presence is based on CRDTs, and in this talk he explains uh, CRDTs in a very enjoyable way. And the last paper is, I think it's the one on which Phoenix Presence implementation is based on. That's it all I had for you. Thank you.